Good morning, I'm Chris Barnes, and I want to welcome you to Lakeland Community College and the first in our series of the Siemens Distinguished Lecture Series in Engineering, Manufacturing, and Entrepreneurship. And as you can see from this wonderful turnout of students, community members, and Lakeland uh, uh, people, um, this is a need in Lake County that has been unmet up to this point. It is a fantastic turnout, and thank you so much, all of you, for coming out today. Um, the, the Siemens uh, Lecture Series is brought to us by a donation of the Building Technology Division of Siemens Industry. I'd like to introduce, uh, for a moment, uh, Charlie Cohen. He's the National Sustainability Education Director of Siemens. Uh, and his job is to integrate education into Siemens' mission. The goal is to provide students, students opportunities that will lead to careers in energy-related fields, including environmental and energy engineering, as well as 21st century green technician jobs. So please help me to uh, thank and welcome Charlie Coney as a few words. I guess the first thing I'm going to say is, can I have a copy of that introduction? Because <laughs> my mother would be proud. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Charlie Cohen, and I have I I have the greatest job on the earth. I get to do programs like this from Alaska to Florida, and from Maine to Southern California. And I'm on the road a lot, but I get to work and meet with phenomenal people uh, that are trying to do good things, moving our country forward. Uh, Mike Mayer uh, that you have here uh, as, a, as a VP of Finance uh, is so much more than that. He, had a, he has a vision as how he wants to support the college and add the, stu the students. And we have been working together for five years to develop this relationship and only good things have come, come of it. I want to take one moment, I've got two minutes, normally I can't introduce myself in less than 15. Um, <laughs> Siemens is so much more uh, than a building technologies company. It is a technology integration company, and it deals in every aspect and spectrum of manufacturing and industrial development that you could ever imagine. And when we see snippets of commercials, uh, we have a saying in our own organization, and my colleagues from the branch, the, the local branch here, will understand it's if Siemens only knew what Siemens knows. Siemens really would be dangerous. Uh, we have a transportation division in Sacramento that builds high-speed rail, but it also deals with mobility. It deals with software controlling traffic, software controlling parking. It deals with city traffic. It deals with buildings. It deals with the smart grid. It deals with the buildings. It deals with the in infrastructure of our facilities, as you well know on this campus because we've had a long and sort of relationship with you. However, there are so many more pieces. We have our manufacturing division, which produces the product lifecycle management software, which is the gold standard of the manufacturing industry. Now, we have our competitors, but Siemens software was used in the Mar Mars rover. Uh, it has been, it is used by GM, it's used by Ford, it's used by major manufacturers all over the country. We have our industrial automation, we have our industrial automation group and so the point that I'm trying to make is is that Siemens although it's a country in itself is a German based company but we have our Siemens USA and one of the things that they are extremely extremely sensitive to is that we consider ourselves an American manufacturing company with 90% of our employees in almost every one of our factories from this country and we qualify when we go after U.S. federal contracts within our manufacturing as a U.S. company. So as you do this, uh, I want you to know that we look forward to a continued partnership uh, with Lakeland over the years to come and doing really good things with y'all. And I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. This is better rather than leaning. This is ridiculous. I don't know what to do here. Okay. 
Any, do, am I, do I look ridiculous on camera? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, thank you, Charlie. That is wonderful, and we are delighted at Lakeland that you have, we have your support. It is fantastic. And thank you all again for coming out this morning to hear about wind power in Ohio. And this is going in and out, too. Um, today we're going to hear about the successes, the realities, and the pitfalls of wind power. And I'm not giving anything away, I don't think, when I say that even after the technical issues are handled, the political issues become much, much more and maybe more difficult to handle. But that's a talk for another day. I know I'm not, I'm not committing uh, Aaron to speak about that. I'd like to introduce our speaker this morning. Aaron Godwin is the founder of the Renaissance Group, which is a consulting and implementation firm specializing in site assessment, efficiency, conservation, and renewable energy. He is joined today with, by two of his colleagues, Bob Weinberg, over here, can you show, show you hand? And Crystal Naylor, who will join in the presentation for the question and answer time. Uh, Mr. Godwin is the Vice Chair of the ASES Small Wind Division, a lead accredited professional, and a member of the Ohio Wind Working Group. Um, he's, they've all been involved in some key <coughs> renewable energy initiatives and wind monitoring data collection systems, including the Cleveland Crib Wind Monitoring Project on Lake Erie, which is the only offshore wind monitoring station in the region. Uh, I've heard stories of Aaron and Bob uh, going out and taking data out on the crib and being chased in by major storms as they're trying to get back in after getting their data. So their dedication is amazing. In my opinion, though, the fact that you have to stand up on the top of one of those wind turbines is infinitely scarier to me. So I don't know how you do it. It's amazing. Uh, Aaron holds a BS degree in four areas, environment and society, appropriate technology, education, and community from Hampshire College in Massachusetts, and he lives in Kirtland, Ohio. Please help me welcome Aaron Godwin. Well, first of all, I really would like to thank uh, both Lakeland and Siemens. Um, this type of leadership is really what this region needs. Um, we are certainly talking about a relevant topic. Um, and I think one of the things I want to talk about, I'm, I'm going to kind of get into it in my presentation, but Ohio's story really is a national, international story. And that's how we need to look at in the scope. We're not isolated here in Lake County. We're not isolated in Kirtland. We're not isolated in Ohio. We're not isolated in the United States. We're not isolated in North America. We are in a global economy and a global environment. And that's really the context we need to look at these things. So uh, you kind of heard a little bit about who we are. I'm going to go through this. Now, I've basically been asked to cover an entire industry and all the things that are associated with it um, in less than an hour. So this will be a lot of fun. Um, we're going to do very brief overviews. And so what I'm going to do is try to leave time for questions and answers at the end. We, we, I will stay after the 9 o'clock period where folks, if the folks want to stay and ask more questions. I actually think that this topic is going to be interesting enough we can follow up with more detailed uh, seminars and workshops and things like that if there is interest. So I'll just put it out there. So first of all, I'm going to cover who we are very quickly. Context for wind energy putting in the big picture, technology overview, world, US, Ohio installation trends, and opportunities and jobs in wind, uh, specifically in Ohio. So first of all, wh who we are, we're the folks, we started out actually developing wind maps, helping with Green Energy Ohio, Seed Ohio, develop the Ohio wind maps, uh, which started the whole conversation. The big projects like the crib, offshore mid wind monitoring, it was really the only one of its type in the entire world, helicopter air crane installation, uh, first time that had ever been done. We continue to monitor that system, do ice sensors, uh, wind data. You can actually, um, some of that data is available online. Um, we also do the power systems for the city of Cleveland's Homeland Security sites. So that's a lot of fun. Uh, we have done a lot of other projects, small, large, uh, for utility scale uh, wind research, for uh, independent w research, uh, educational integrated exhibits, uh, solar, small wind, large wind. The ones we're probably most known for recently is the Kilowatts for Education program, which is a program we developed. Um, and really, it's what it's about is um, coming up with projects that are e not just educationally viable. You've seen a lot of these projects here. They put up kind of this icon. 
you know, a little solar panel, a little wind turbine, and, and they tie education to it. Well, we wanted projects that are actually economically viable. We wanted projects that were going to save teaching positions in a state where we're laying teachers off. So one of our projects saves two to six positions per year at one of these sites and is structured in such a way that the cash flows start positive out, out of the gate. So you can actually go online. Um, and you can go to projects, and there's a website, and I'm going to go through this very quickly to show it. Each one of our sites are un unusual, again, because they're, they're viable projects. Um, actually, it looks like Kenston. Let's go to another site. We got maintenance going on right now. It's just a bad timing. So there's Pettisville, and that's Northwest Ohio, Kenston, and Geauga County. So each one of these sites has a real-time camera. They also have live data you can go to. Hopefully we'll refresh on these computers. And you can see right now that machine's producing over 200 kW. This, t this data refreshes near real time. Um, this is just the public side, which has is, is got a, a, um, a lot more than you'll see almost any other kind of uh, renewable energy installation as far as the quality of data, it's secondary certifiable data streams. But there's a whole back end side of this, which literally has millions and millions of data points that are available to students. So we have a program called Real Kids Doing Real Science where kids actually get to work with the same kind of data that science do, literally, and we structure it in such a way that it's K through 12, and we have all the support infrastructures we're developing to go along with that. So we have these beta sites out there. There's, there's four large turbines, uh, mid-scale, uh, what used to be utility scale, now would be considered mid-size, so 500 to 750 kW, and then there's some solar arrays, solar thermal, uh, smaller arrays on it. So I encourage you to check that out later. It really is something I'd like to actually see Lakeland join that partnership with or without a turbine because the data is there. Uh, setting the stage, I want, again, Ohio successes, realities, pitfalls story is really a national story. You know, our success, you kind of say, oh, so Ohio goes, the nation goes. Well, it really is true. And if you look at it in an, in an international scale, especially when it comes to developing technologies, industry jobs, manufacturing, all those things, our link, environmental impact, all those things, our link is really there. Um, so we put that in context. I want you to just envision this for a second. Every two and a half, I'm sorry, every second, two and a half babies are popped out. So just envision that for a second. I get a real fun image every time I think about that. So every second, two and a half kids are popping out population is, is a real player in this because what's happening is, is most of these folks that are, that are being born, uh, even with the, the birth rates in China and India and, and, and Brazil and all these other countries declining and starting to become um, more like the Western world, they are trying to achieve a Western lifestyle. And what's that mean? That means energy use. It means resource use. So putting in context, good, bad, or indifferent, that's the facts. Um, use of finance, finite resources are increasing, so you can take all the politics out of that, that's just facts. More people use more resources, and I'm kind of a reality-based environmentalist, I don't need to hold a sign up, just give me the data. Um, energy and resource choices impact the environment, that's a fact. Economics are linked to energy, security is ever and ever, and water would be another one you can stick in that category, but those are directly linked to our security, national security, even local security. Quality of life is certainly impacted by energy, at least the way we interpret quality of life now and seems to be the trends that the world's heading for. So the top picture is kind of fun. That's the, that's the left, uh, it's the lights at night kind of one we've probably seen around. It really shows where energy is being used now. The second one down is actually showing pollution, and guess who that is? That's our region, uh, North America, and then you can see China, just insane, that rather red spot you see there. And then you can see Europe up here, and then you've got a, a little bit in South America going on. And the other part, the bottom one there, that's actually from the oil companies themselves, um, peak oil. I really don't care when it happens, because even their own arguments all put it within this century. Of what peak oil is, is basically when we think we're going to start using more oil than we have resources left. Um, and I, I, again, I'm a reality-based guy. I'd like to see the societies last a little bit longer than 100 years, and so my planning really doesn't care whether that's going to happen tomorrow or 50 years out. And that's really the context that they're talking about for that. And you can kind of see this thing. It's all interlinked. You can go back and forth on it. So meeting this demand is going to really require a lot of different technologies. This is very, very important, especially for the United States. There is no way the United States can get all of its energy from renewables. It's impossible any time in the near future. Not, not even possible in the next 50 years. 
and we have a goal of 2030 at 20%, that might be achievable 20%. There are countries in the world that could achieve 100%. There are states in the U.S. that could achieve 100%, but as a country, we cannot. So we are looking at a mix of reality. And guess which two countries have the most coal resources? Anybody? China and the U.S. <laughs> That's a reality. Now, even with natural gas coming on and all that, it's going to be a mix, and so renewables are just part of that. But the number one thing, and it's not, I call it, it's not as sexy as renewables, but energy efficiency and conservation by far has the biggest impact, without question. It's the easiest to achieve. 20% efficiency is, is, is walk in the door, and every time we do an energy audit, it's, I don't even have to barely open my eyes, I get 20%. 70% in a facility, even in industrial facilities, is possible, but as you get closer to that mark, uh, and this is with current technology, by the way. As you get closer to that mark, costs go up, investments go up, paybacks go out, levels of difficulty go up. So, and we've proven this. Uh, basically, and nothing else is cheaper. We already have the technology, and this is, that's really the focus. So, but, but I was asked to come here and talk about wind, but I do think it's important to keep on mentioning efficiency and conservation. So wind, here we are. I want to get into the, some, some brief physics here, because this is important. Wind power is based predominantly on the cubic relationship of wind speed, the cube of the wind speed. So decimal points really do matter. And this is going to come in, we, we're going to talk about technologies here in a second. So obviously air density plays into a, into a factor, turbulence, all these other factors play into the, re, the, the impact. But if you want to look at the big multiplier that really impacts the power that is in the wind, the power that we can get out of the wind, it is based on the cube of the, of the wind speed. Swept area. You can only capture energy out of the area that you are harvesting. I cannot get wind from the next county over, no matter how hard I try. I can only get it out of the area. And this is some of the most, the, even big companies make this mistake in their technologies and, they, and their claims that they have out there for their machines. You can only get it out of the swept area. So that's that, that rotor or the area that's harvesting the wind. Something called the bets limit, 59%. So I could ask somebody to come up here and try to blow this wall over for me. Does the wall move? No, the wall does not move. If you put 50 blades on a machine or 100 blades on the machine or you create such a ducting fan situation where you're trying to draw the wind and you create a wall, what's the wind going to do? It is going to either stop or it's going to divert around your device. And that's why, you, kind of interesting, this is a key point when you look at Modern wind turbines, you'll see that they have a lot in that swept area. There's a lot of open air, and that is how the machines work. The air must flow through the machine, and that is true of drag-based machines, too. If you stop all the wind or you divert all the wind, you no longer are capturing wind, or the power in the wind. So that bets limit is 59% is the theoretical limit. If you can reach 35 to 40-some percent, you're considered good. So theoretically, you can get 59% out of the wind. Turbulence. I don't care what kind of machine you are, turbulence matters. So if you stick a machine on top of in a woods or behind your house or behind your factory or an urban setting on a short tower, you are going to have decreased production regardless of what type of that machine is. So these folks that are putting these machines right directly on rooftops or, or you see these towers of machines with the turbines sitting down in the trees, it will rob the machine of its power. It's just absolute fact. Nameplate rating versus site. So a turbine might be rated at 10 kW. Is it going to produce 10 kW all the time? No, that's its rating at a given wind speed, usually somewhere around 30 miles per hour. We call the capacity factor, which is based in that wind resource, that location. It might be, in our region, might be 10 to 15 percent of that. So you might be getting 1.5 kW out of that machine on average. Some days you'll get 10, some days you may be getting a little bit more. Most days you're going to get very low. So actually, and again, going back to cubic dependence, most of that energy in the wind is coming out of very short duration events. So storms, morning evening effect, those types of events, the average is actually quite low for, for machines. And that's true of all machines, utility scale, so the capacity factor, that nameplate rating versus the reality of what the machine's going to do. That's not a bad thing. It's just the reality of what machines produce. So, and then the last thing here is, um, availability comes into, the last one is availability, which is, is a machine broken? or is it down for maintenance? And there's a typically 95% availability or better is what we would expect out of a machine. 
Um, so that will also derate. If it's, if it's down for maintenance, obviously it's not generating. And then uh, the other one is the kilowatt hour. KW is the unit we get built, or KW is the unit we measure power in. Kilowatt hour is what we get built in. And so as we look at, at these technologies over time, that's really becomes important to think about the kilowatt hours being produced, not the KW rating. So decimal points matter in this. And if you look at this curve, you'll see it goes up very, very quickly because of that cubic dependence. So 12 and a half miles an hour is a lot more than 12. So think about that. person holds their finger up and says, I got good wind. They may or may not have good wind. So that cubic dependence is incredibly important. So this one, do not get your eyes blurred on this, but it's actually a really awesome thing. This is a Weibel curve. This is actually from an Ohio site, typical of Ohio. It's, this is for a V27 turbine, or, uh, which would be what's like at the Science Center, 225 kW machine. You look at the power curve here, up and down in this green area. You look at the speeds. We, t we obviously, as scientists, work in meters per second, but the average folks are working miles per hour. And then you look over here, site weather constants, some multipliers, and there's some formulas about 500 miles long behind these things. The wind probability, so this is the probability on average of that wind speed occurring over a year. So 2.94% of the time at this site, it's going to be blowing in that 2.24 miles per hour range. And then you see that power production based on this power curve, the average power coming out of that. So you go down there and you see the totals and of course you'll have a 90, 99% probability, 100% is what you're shooting for at your totals. What I want you to look at here is look at this. So we look at the portion of the wind and that's in this one to seven meter per second range. So most of the time at this site, the wind is blowing very slow, right? 73% of the time. But I'm only getting 30% of my power out of that. Go down to the next one, 8 to 13 miles per, or meters per second. Very minimal amount of time, 26%, so about a quarter of the time. But look, I'm getting 66, 67% of my power out of that short duration event. Again, because of that cubic dependence. So smaller amount of time where that wind is producing, but I'm getting 66.5% of my power. And then you look at this upper end. Well, I'm going to make a machine that really harvests wind at 100 miles per hour. It's almost irrelevant because it hardly ever happens. If you look at the actual probability of that, those high wind speeds happening, and that's basically even above 30 miles per hour, it's, it's, it's less than 1% of the time at this site. And this is true of Ohio. Now you get into the Midwest and other sites, these numbers will change a little bit. It's actually different for every site. Um, but you'll see 2.6%. So if I'm going to design the optimal machine for this site, where is my target? It's in that middle range, right? I'm going to be shooting for that middle range. And this is such a key fact. You see these folks, well, I've designed a machine that'll start generating at one mile per hour, which is an absolute lie to begin with, but let's say they can do it. You know, that's great if you can get it for free, but if you have to spend a lot of money to do that and generate very little power does not make a lot of sense. So turbulence matters. They say typically seven times the distance away from the, of the nearest objects where you want to be away. If you're putting in a house a tree, all those things at basically is robbing power. That's why, especially in sites like Ohio, because of the high wind shear, the difference between this wind speed at the ground and as you go up in, air, in the air, tower height matters. So also matters to clear your turbulence, which could be everything from literally the ground itself to trees to obstructions. Lifetime cost for kilowatt hour matters, cradle to grave. So think about this in the terms, we rarely do this. Think about terms of literally from the second you come up with the idea, the cost, to harvesting the raw materials, the iron, the copper, the, the, the petroleum products, the, the whatever it may be that goes into this human, the transportation, every single thing that's involved in all the person hours, all the materials, everything that goes into building that widget that you're going to make. You've got to think about the lifetime cost all the way through to its whole time of production and, and operation cost and maintenance and all that to the time that we have to take it down and recycle it or do whatever we do with it. That's the whole lifetime cost and that's what we need to be thinking about in energy, all energies. And we don't do it right now. We do not consider whole life costs, certainly from a societal perspective, we do not. So whole life cost per, per whatever that energy unit is, whether it's driving your car down the road or it's producing electricity. And all those things, it affects all those things we talked about before, to the, the, the security issues, to the, to the maintenance, all those issues are in there. So we think about this in technologies that are being discussed. And you know, I, I don't want to bash too much here, but, 
but there's a reason that the turbines right now look the way they do. So you've got these, you've got these vertical axis machines that everybody's developing out of the garage. There are literally a over a thousand companies out there producing these things. And what it comes down to is, again, I'm a blatant guy, show me the data. If you have to use six times the amount of material to make that machine to produce the same amount of power, it may be an awesome, awesome technology. It may have a place in the world, but when we're talking about lifetime cost, you have to think about it. So, so when we look at these technologies, I mean, this one in the center is an awesome thing. It, it's basically a, a dirigible that goes up in the air and generates power. Gonna go reach, and their idea is we're going to avoid that low-level turbulence and all that. We're going to get way up. We're going to go up 1,000 feet. Well, it's a great idea, but you have to think about the cost, maintenance, and is that thing actually going to function over time? It's, it's actually, I support as a research. This one's kind of interesting. We're going to generate our own wind. So we're going to create a tower that's like 500 feet tall. And we're going to create this big thermal mass, and we're going to store it. It's kind of cool because it's going to solve the, the, the storage problem. We're going to store it during the day and, and use it up at night so we can get even flow. We're going to create wind. You know the concept works. The physics work. But does it make economic and environmental sense? By the time you have all the material involved in that for the power you're going to get out, and that's true of most of these technologies. This, this is one actually, I hope there's nobody here. This is a local company that produced this thing with lots of claims about how great it was and its price per kilowatt hour. I hate to say it, price per kilowatt hour is stupid. The thing only produces a, a thousand watts, but it costs $30,000 or $50,000. I can't remember what this was. I think it's even more than that. It doesn't make sense. No matter how great it spins in a circle. And this is the idea of we're going to create a big, you know, we're going to harvest that wind and funnel it in. And it's true, we'll harvest the wind from a larger area and focus it on a smaller area. In theory, there's more power density in that area, but you have to pay for all that material that it costs. And you also have to orient that thing into the wind, all kinds of issues. So we were actually involved, and I'm not speaking that from this from blind, we actually were, were hired a couple years ago, my entire company basically for a couple years, were hired to try to go salvage a company that was doing research, and this was their pro research station was in South Texas, and a helical Savonius rotor design. And what we learned was what we thought we would learn is the technology works, the price per kilowatt hour is insane, the material usage is insane, Part of it is that the harmonics, in order to get these things up on a tall enough tower, the harmonics of these things, and the engineers in the room will know what that means, that basically like a guitar string, as things synchronize harmonically, you need a tremendous amount of structure to keep these things standing, certainly not something you would want to install in your house. And then it comes down to price per kilowatt hour. What we did learn from that, because we actually had over, I think it was 5 billion data points we collected at the site of multiple MET towers. At, collecting at subset second levels at every 10 meters. Insane amount of data we have at this site. What we did learn is there's some really interesting micro siting possibilities even in urban areas. The wind, even around this building, is very different as you move out from the building and up from the building. And understanding those shear layers is an opportunity for the entrepreneurs in the room. So you look at this, building integrated, that's a possibility. Right now, there's so many problems with it. And these big ones you hear about are in like Dubai. Um, they basically threw brute force at it, and the machines do work. But a lot of folks talk about building integrated, but all I say is the tech concepts work, but it's price per kilowatt hour, unless you're talking about architectural advantage of art. Um, but you've got to really understand lots of different levels of physics to make it work. What, one of the exciting things that's happening is our ability to monitor track wind is actually improved, our ability to model. This, this comes into dispatchable wind, which is trying to predict exactly when the wind's going to happen so you know when your peaking plant has to kick in when the wind's not blowing. Because as, as the dents increase the production of wind, obviously you have to keep the lights on. The wind stops blowing, how are you going to replace that resource? So being able to predict wind, the micro siting, the SODAR, LIDAR, and, and computational fluid dynamics modeling, CFD analysis allows, is allowing us to do much cooler things. So now they actually have these LIDARs that actually look out from the turbine nose and literally at the sub-second level are watching the wind come in so they can pre-pitch the blades as the wind's coming in. Think about that technology. They're still playing with it, but it's coming. Fun things. This is a company right here in, in uh, Cleveland. Well, not here, but in Cleveland, a little bit over. Company is working on this, there's others doing this. This is just fun ideas to think about, thinking outside the box, because NASA's pretty much optimized, and others have optimized the wind turbine blade that we see out there, the, the lift based blade. There's some problems with it, just like airplanes. They get to stall, they, they go up in the air, and they get to a point where they're not efficient, or they're, they're, they're a single 
shape. They don't change shape, and so they're really optimized for a single wind speed. How do you do that? Well, this is really cool. Without any moving, some of them have micro turbulence devices, basically inducing micro turbulences on the blade to cause the wind to adhere to the blade, increasing efficiency. And others have this plasma, which is really cool, and it, literally almost a paintable finish where you can adjust that and literally at the speed of light or very close to it, you can adjust the aerodynamic characteristics of that blade as that wind is coming in. Imagine that. So that kind of thinking outside the box, thinking of new ways to develop technology is really where the next round of efficiency is going to come. And I've seen this happen. I've seen airplanes models of this where flying with no movable parts. It's very, very cool all just by creating plasma fields. And you can actually see it in the diagrams. You see the normal one, you see this turbulence. Again, we're trying to get rid of this turbulence as, they, as the air tries, it loses adhesion with that airfoil. Um, really cool stuff. Here's another fun one. You guys can do this in your science class or at home. Take some old eight tra tra track tape, string it between two things tight, put a magnet around it, and let it go in the wind. What will happen is that it'll vibrate. Anytime you have movement, that's energy you can harvest the magnet magnetic field or coil will harvest that energy, the technology works. Now, imagine that magnified at a billion of them out there on a surface. Think about that in context. And then imagine it at the nano level. Imagine it as a paint finish that did something like that. And again, there's lots of problems to work out there, but as an entrepreneur, that's an opportunity. And that's what I'm trying. I'm just, these are just some minor, minor examples to think that's where the next technology gains. Now, we've got made gains in in controls, we've made gains in material science. That's really where the economic boom has happened in the last few years in wind turbine technology, but we haven't made a fundamental shift in technologies in quite a while. So there's a reason that the turbines you see out there are basically, they're three-bladed, they're on a stick, the, the, the generators up top, the controls are usually, or most of the big controls and power electronics are at the bottom. It's basically a thing. You actually look at this upper left hand, this is actually the most efficient design, which is a single bladed turbine. You don't see those around. The reason you don't see those around is because of that going back to the whole life cost. The, 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 the pressure that that puts into the system as that blade passes in front of the tower, you can imagine that shock as it unloads wind. And that's one of the reasons you don't see two-bladed machines that often, because it does the same thing. A three-bladed machine equals that out. And that's why we've kind of, if that makes sense, we've actually settled in to three-bladed machines, lift-based machines, so similar to like an airplane works, and they are flying through. And you'll see variants of them where there will be a couple more blades, uh, but in general terms, it's three-bladed machines on a stick. That's where, we're, that's where we are. There's basically two variants of those. There's the gearbox drive, so you've got the low speed wind, and, and you kind of think about this, these machines, like a Lincoln Electric is spinning at, uh, I can't remember, 16 RPM or something like that. The blade tip speed is approaching 300 miles per hour, just to think about going around the outside of that circle. But you've got the shaft is actually spinning very slowly, and, these, and the utility scale machines may be spinning anywhere, the really big ones, 10 RPM, to the smaller ones, maybe 50 RPM. That's not enough to generate electricity and not enough to sink to the grid. And so what you do is you have to speed that up. And how do you speed it up? You speed it up with a gearbox. Well, imagine all that torque going through that gearbox, and that's a challenge. So the other idea is we're going to create the, the generator, make the generator field really big. We're going to do a direct drive machine that can handle that lower RPM. So those are two basic styles, direct drive where, where it's directly linked to the generator, and the other style where it's linked through a gearbox. And that kind of gives you a sense of the uh, speed of, of um, I'm sorry, the, the two basic methods. There's lots and lots of other parts that go in there. So types of wind projects we'll see, and again, you don't have to really read this, but they literally go the, the gamut all the way from things that are less than 50 feet tall to things that are over 500 feet tall. There's, there's projects, actually I think you guys, Siemens has one that they're working on that is considerably larger than that. Um, so these things, and again, in general terms, you look at the at, at scale, there, there's Terminal Tower, there's Lincoln Electric, um, so you get a sense of scale there, Statue of Liberty kind of putting in context. So, that, so that's, you know, that's, Lincoln Electric is actually equivalent to the, the, basically the largest machines in the country, very similar. Um, so pretty serious machine, saves them a lot of money per year. Uh, and then the, obviously the larger the swept area, the more power you're going to get out. Typically you'll have a larger swept area to try to capture more power in a lower wind speed regime. So a machine in Ohio, let's say a one megawatt machine, would typically have longer blades 
because we have a lower wind resource to try to get that, where if it was in Iowa somewhere, it'd have a smaller swept area to get the same amount of energy. Again, that energy traveling through space. And then the tower height is absolutely critical because as you go up in elevation, the wind speeds increase. And because of that cubic relationship, getting a half mile an hour gain is big time in money. All right, so trends. Trends are going larger, keep getting larger and larger, but we're actually starting to run into some interesting problems here. Transportation, physically can't get them underneath the wires, can't get them on the roads, can't get them on the trains, can't get them around the corner. Gearboxes, especially with material sciences, they can't handle, the, imagine that massive amount of lever arm happening on a blade that that's, could be over 200 feet long, pushing on this single point on that gearbox that could be the size of my fist. And imagine the materials can't, even hardened and, and annealed steels cannot hold up to that anymore. So that we're really reaching our current limits of understanding as far as material science in, in these drivetrain systems. Uh, cranes, some of these cranes need 50 truckloads to just get the crane to the site. And then you need four cranes to assemble the crane to put up the t tower. So you're talking big cranes. The cranes themselves can cost $5 million, $10 million. So the cranes are just insanely big. The manufacturing infrastructure, and then we talked about material science. So there's, there's again, opportunities there. So we, all right, so now we know about the wind turbine technology. Let's talk a little bit about where the wind is. So on a world scale, we got wind everywhere, almost everywhere. In this particular map, your, your high wind is the red areas that you get more into the red tones. Those are your higher winds. So obviously you see the central United States. Look at Greenland is an insane amount of wind. Uh, tip of, you know, Argentina, uh, Europe, especially uh, countries like uh, Great Britain. Uh, parts of China, uh, you've got massive amounts of wind all over the place. And then these other sites, you may have micro siting. So, so that's kind of where the wind is. And then obviously the big one is offshore and they change the colors on it as you can see. But basically in general terms, generic terms, just think about two plus times amount of energy offshore is onshore. So there's a lot more energy out there to capture, but the cost of capturing energy is also about twice as much. So we're still playing that game, trying to figure that one out. You know, actually it all started here. Anybody know about Charles Brush and Euclid Avenue, first utility interconnected turbine? Euclid Avenue right here in the 1800s. Um, we like to think the crib is the first offshore, it probably isn't the first offshore in the country or the world, but it's certainly one of them. And then uh, Plumbrook, NASA's Plumbrook, first investigations of utility scale wind right here in Ohio, uh, actually a machine was installed in Hawaii. But um, what happened is we kind of gave up on it, let it go, and guess who picked it up? The Europeans did. So the Europeans kind of took it and ran with it. And for probably about almost 20 years, they kind of ran with it without a lot of other activity. So your Denmarks, your Germanys, your Spains, those countries all kind of playing into it. And you look at their, their growth trend just continuing up here. And you see there's some public policy because the irony is actually Germany has less wind resource than Ohio does. But they had a public policy that really pushed it. So massive, it's true of a lot of these other countries, Spain, um, United Kingdom actually has had both things going on, policy and good wind. Um, but you see what happened there. Now you look at, at what's happening is the United States is coming back into the game. And of course, our friend China is coming back into the game. And we're kind of bouncing back and forth with who's going to be first place, both in yearly installations as well as um, cumulative in installations. But the overall trend globally, look at this curve. It's the fastest growing energy sector in the entire world. It's in the trillions of dollars if you look at it in the, in the, in the big scale. Um, direct sales are in the, in the high billions. Uh, humongous, humongous market. So we look at it and say, okay, these countries are producing all this wind, but who's actually using it as a percentage of your power? So what this graph shows is we produce a lot more than a lot of other countries in that. China does too, but we also use a lot more than other people. So you actually have countries like Denmark which are you know, almost 30% of their power is coming from, from wind. And if you throw in other renewables, they're probably over 40% right now. The uh, United States is still down there. I think we're actually approaching 6% now maybe. Um, the total world's probably in that range. So that's really, really changed in the last few years. Because again, we're growing. It's, it used to be where we weren't even in the decimal points. But now wind is a significant player and growing player in the, in the international community. But again, it, you can't produce, you know, a country like Denmark, which has got a lot of efficiencies going on, a lot less power usage than we do, they can actually achieve that in the short term, 100% of their, or near 100%. For us to do that is a, would be 
in a monumental task, or China, or any country like, like us. All right, so what's the U.S. wind resource? Basically, in this case, it's the purple. That's the hot, hot spot. It's the Central Plains is a, is a sweet spot. And then offshore, uh, again, uh, Ohio is kind of split down the middle with what we call economic to marginal to forget it wind. Uh, if you go down to the southeastern Ohio, unless you're talking a few micro siting situations, there really is no wind. And then you look at the poor folks down in, in the southeastern part with current technology and the reality of physics, regardless of what technology says, they're always going to have a hard time economically producing power in the course in the mountains. You look at states like California, lots of micro siting situations in California, so they don't look that good there, but they really are a lot better than, than they show up in the map. So this is kind of fun. So this is, we're going to go and see what the wind is doing today. This is actually live, um, well, it's a live simulation of today's wind. And you want to, what I want you to get a sense is, is wind is a dynamic thing. You see that central plains effect, and it changes, um, obviously, by the day. You can see that the brighter white, the faster the trails, the faster the wind is going. This is a, you can, it's cool, you can pull up uh, Hurricane Sandy or other stuff in there. I just put it out there so you get a sense of how wind works. It's a dynamic thing. It's changing constantly. This is just fun to spend about an hour of your time just playing with the site. It's really, really cool. Uh, this is actually Hurricane Sandy coming ashore. Um, very, very cool. And again, you can even see in, in here, here I'm pointing to the screen, nobody can see me pointing to the screen. Uh, you can see the, the, the central plains coming out and then you kind of have this conflict between the Arctic trying to fight with the Gulf of Mexico. Think about those two constantly trying to balance each other. And then you got throw the mountains in there and then you got the Great Plains and Yeeha, tornado alley wind. Um, and micro siting again, e east and west of that. Oh, I knew that was gonna happen. Let me see if I can get out of here. Get way over here. So yeah, where is it getting installed? This is interesting. These are actually the sites, uh, I believe the orange is new in 2012. Prior to 2012 was white, so you can see how much is being added. And you'll see a shift. You saw before that the wind regime was like right through here, but why is it occurring over in here? And this is still pretty good wind in Iowa. But what's happening is they're trying to get closer to the population centers because there's not a lot of people living in Nebraska and South Dakota, but there are a lot of people living in Chicago, Minneapolis. So you start seeing this wind shift over these areas. Also public policy issues, things playing in there. Texas is playing in. The also cost of power is going to play into that. So you throw all that in there, you actually see there's, there's not a lot of really good wind and again, micro siting issues in, in New England, but very high cost of powers and, and very high public policy pushing for it. Same thing in California. You actually look at this map here, it's showing the additions. You can kind of see them. And I, again, I had to cut slides, so I put it in there so you can see the effect um, of the, how fast the wind is coming on. Ohio was, was seven megawatts forever. And now we're over 400 and with over 2,000 megawatts in the queue. So most of it is happening in um, Western, Ohio, Western Ohio. Oh, I had that hyperlinked. No, really, I mean it. So offshore wind, people ask about it. Well, there you'll see the Great Lakes, the Lee Coast work, trying to get wind turbines in Lake Erie, but you'll also see the East Coast, uh, Gulf of Mexico. Interestingly enough, not a lot of happening on the West Coast, even though there's very good wind out there. Part of that reason is politics, and part of that reason is very deep water. So hard to install. Uh, generation trends, you'll see actually a lot of people think the gas boom is happening now from a generation standpoint. It was actually happening in the early 2000s for power production. And that is shifted and you'll see wind is the fastest growing, that's this track here, wind is the fastest growing track of energy being added per year. And you actually see solar coming on now too. Um, and you'll see new coal and this, a lot of this is coal addition to addition, ad existing plants. Some of this has to do with it's harder to permit new coal than it is. Uh, some other technologies, natural gas, obviously, with the, the new shale, shale gases, and then uh, being balanced by the drive to try to get emissions down. You'll see those, those are hanging in there, but wind is obviously still playing a very uh, strong, increasing role in our overall power. This map is actually really cool because, again, it shows that 30-year trend of where we're headed for trying to get to this, this uh, 315 gigawatts or thereabouts, 300 plus gigawatts by 2030. And you'll actually see down here we're actually above the trend of where we're predicted to be. We're actually installed more than we thought. And what's, I, what I like about this map is it's showing the predictions and it's actually once in life the predictions are actually more or less following trend. What I think is actually gonna happen though is it's gonna fall off here. 
as we, we've, we've done the easy projects at this point, and so now you're going to start having projects become more and more difficult, and you're going to start seeing um, installations fall off. This light blue line is actually showing that the um, that offshore is part of it. We have, no, we have no offshore in this country right now, but they're predicting that there's going to be, offshore is going to play a major role, probably about 50 gigawatts by, um, by 2030. And again, we have none yet, so that's, that's predicting that's going to happen. But you can see kind of the trends of where that's headed. What about small wind? This is talking about residential. The government, typical politicians for a second, they think anything is small wind under 100 kW. Well, the reality is small wind, in my mind, is really down in the, the residential size, which is in your 10 kW or minus. But the reality is the same. The market's stagnant, and it has been for a long time. And that has to do with cost, it has to do with public perception, it has to do with difficulty of installation and permitting, it has to do with lots of things, it has to do with, uh, to be honest, a lot of really, really bad technology out there. It's been an unregulated market. Now my work with ASIS, um, National American Solar Energy Society, uh, wind division has been trying to get these smaller machines certified in a similar way to the big machines. So you, when you buy a machine, you know the power curve is actually going to do what they said it would do. You know the machine is going to have the noise acoustic level that they promised. It's going to have the, the maintenance record that they promised. So we're trying to certify these machines. But right now their market's stagnant. Um, everybody's, you know, they're still installing, but there's really no major growth in that market right now. And then you look at it continue, the pricing has continued to decline. Now, the interesting thing about this, the challenge is, these turbines are really big. What do they have in them? They have a lot of commodities. So they're highly linked to the commodities market. Humongous. You could have hundreds of thousands of pounds of steel, hundreds of thousands of pounds of concrete, lots and lots of copper. So you've got this thing linked to this commodity market. And there's a technology opportunity, again, out there for those entrepreneurs, is how do we get some of that commodity out of there? Because we really can't control that price. So where we've seen prices is in economies of scale, manufacturing, efficiencies, and things like that, and then you'll see it following the commodity, the commodity uh, track. But that's a, that's a big challenge in it right now because these things just require so much bloody material to make. Um, the cost has actually been dropping, um, and you'll see that the cost, obviously, for, for smaller projects is higher than it is for... Um, for larger projects. And here's a really good example of that. These are those less than five megawatts. And this is still uti utility scale machines. Uh, residential would be even higher than this. Cost per, per, um, per kW. So in rough terms, uh, you know, we're talking $2,500 to $3,000 per kW in the, in the small project range to, and this is all in installed, um, to, to down below $2,000 a K, or $2, a kW or $2 a watt installed. So obviously economies of scale do make a big player, but you also see that kind of level out. You see not much difference between that project that's 100, 100 megawatts and the one that's 200 megawatts. This is kind of confusing. Again, I don't want you to get caught up in this, but this is a power purchase agreement. This is what's driving a lot of wind development is who's buying it. Utilities are buying it uh, predominantly. And what you'll see is if you link it to the interior regions, that's this purple area, where there's lots and lots of wind, there's not a lot of people, and so the price of those power purchase agreements is very low. Where you go into the West, where we have lots of public policy, lots of need, the power purchase prices are very high. Great Lakes, we're kind of in the middle. Uh, southeast, I don't know what's going on down there because they don't really have much. Uh, they're all over the place and actually represented by here. So the other thing is cost of power. You'll see like Texas has got a very high cost of power. States like New York, New England have cost, high cost of power. That balance is another impact of where the wind's being installed. Ohio, you can see, is kind of in the middle and depending where you are. Um, natural gas kind of plays interesting into this. So you say, does it compete with natural gas? Well, it certainly competes with new coal. No question about it. Wind is very, very competitive with new coal technology. And it is competitive with gas, even with the shale gas out there. Part of that is because there's a production tax credit for wind. Even without the production tax credit, there's an argument that it can kind of still compete, but it does make it harder. But new gas, new wind are definitely in the game together. We'll see what happens with, with natural gas prices. I think what you're going to see is we kind of had this mad rush into natural gas. You see natural gas prices plummet, which is kind of what you're seeing in this red area here. And pretty much everybody's predicting they're going to stabilize as people kind of pull back out of the market because now the profitability is not there and kind of bank. So you see lots of leases going out there, but you actually see installations. Um, they're still happening, but they're, they're, they're winding down a bit. 
Um, so again, looking out, out at this, natural gas is going to be a big player for a long time. Wind is going to be a big player for a long time. They're going to be in competition for a long time. Both of them are, quote, clean energy sources, um, but neither one of them are perfectly clean. So the other thing that plays into this is public policy. There's a site called uh, Desire USA or whatever it is um, that you can go to and see all these incentives by state. The big one is the portfolio standards, the renewable energy portfolio standards. Ohio's got an advanced energy portfolio standard. These are basically mandates to have a portion of the power used in the state come from renewables. That helps drive the economy of the, of the renewables in that state. 29 states have them in some form or another. I want you to look at this one. I want you to feel the chaos in this because this is what I feel on a daily basis. Don't try to read it because it's too chaotic. This is a renewable energy market. Renewable energy credits is the green attribute, the greenness of the power which has a secondary commodity which can be sold independently on the market and it is a chaotic market and how can you predict your business when you have a chaotic market like this? It's true, it, it's, it's linked to public policy, it's linked to, to whether Stonyfield wants to put that label on their yogurt, it's linked to you, all of you have the ability to buy this in your insurance policies or when you buy your, your airplane trip, you can buy green power and that's where it goes. This is a market that's out there. It helps our projects, but it is not a predictable market because it is unregulated and it is chaos. So what is affecting the wind here? So I got about, boy, they're going to be flying through here. So we got uh, basically the big things is the federal tax credit, this policy, the federal and state governments renewing policies every year with no predictability. Imagine having a factory that would have to be multi-billion dollar investment and not knowing whether your business is going to be there next year. Are you going to make that investment? Think about that in those terms. Uh, continuing to low natural gas prices, wholesale electricity prices, modest electricity demand. Actually, the irony is efficiency improves. We use less power. The market actually decreases for that power. Limited uh, the, the RPS renewable portfolio standards. Growing competition actually in some areas from solar. Um, because solar is easy, even though it's expensive, it's easy. An uh, in, in inadequate transmission, especially in, um, well, actually all over the country, and in, 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 in basically the, 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 um, the limits of the smart grid where it is right now, the ability to get the power to where it's needed. And then obviously you've got all these issues out there, the, the not in my backyard, the land use, the acoustics, radio interference, wildlife, flicker, ice throw, whole life cost, grid saturation, all those things are part of that conversation. So here's just an example, and I, you know, I'm a science guy. It, science versus opinion versus perception is really important to look at these things. One thing I've noticed, every time I do these presentations, I drive myself nuts because I'll see two very predominant statistical analysis by reputable firms and the numbers will be completely different. And they're both in public, in government uh, or, or uh, institutional uh, publications. So here's an example, this is reality based. We think about wildlife and wind. Does wind kill wildlife? Yes. Does wind impact wildlife? Yes. But is it in the, and even in the remote same scale as our other choices? It is not. You look at cats, 100 million plus per year, your house cat, my cat, which I let out this morning, is out doing his job right now and he's probably, our turbines, about two and a half birds per year per turbine, utility scale turbine on average. And that's including bad installations like an in Alamont Pass or bats where they stalled turbines next to bat caves in West Virginia. You look at the whole life things, think about strip mining, fuels, um, mercury contamination, all those things. You put that in context and is wind and all the resources, use of wind have an environmental impact? Yes, it does, but it is not even remotely in the same scale as our other choices in that realm. And then obviously look at all these other things. One, one accident can, can overwhelm. And then obviously the visual thing. That's subjective. I can't quantify that. Some people like it, some people don't. Some people think this is pretty. Some people think this is pretty. I don't know any of us that think this is pretty, and I don't know if you've noticed the, the continuation. Pretty soon there's going to be a wall along the road as they keep adding the IT lines and these telecommunication poles. This is an interesting one here. This is Lackawanna over by Buffalo. These are clipper turbines. That was a, just a brownfield desert, just disgusting pit where they put these up and, it's, and, and most people consider that an improvement. And then there's bad installations, and again, I guess I'll pick on Altamont Pass again, where they just made this ugly, ugly installation of wind turbines. So a lot of it has to do with planning. So what's the wind in Ohio? Yeehaw, we're flying. So the wind in Ohio, again, it's a, it's a Northwest Ohio story and it's a Lake Erie story, uh, predominantly with micro siting in our region, actually here, there's a reason we have some wind turbines here. It's a marginal, well-planned projects are economically viable here. 
Uh, again, elevation is important. Again, look at the offshore thing. This is one of the LECO planning maps, planning these, these initial pilot projects in Lake Erie. Um, water depth, that's why this area is out excluded. Uh, trying to get out the, the orange area would be the better, better wind resource. The irony is the better wind is actually closer to sites like Ashtabula and uh, Lake County but the political, and, and Lorain County, but the political will in Cuyahoga County is where the drive is, so that's where it's going to be installed. Um, and I hate to say it, that's where we did our work because that's where the crib was. Um, and lake depth is obviously playing into that. So offshore wind, it's probably a matter of, of when, not if. Really the reality, utility scale, it's all northwest Ohio. Um, we're over 400 megawatts now with over 2,000 in the queue. Um, again, northwest Ohio. You can kind of see the projects there. Uh, jobs. Uh, I'm sorry, we're, this is kind of jobs. This is Ohio supported, uh, most of the Ohio supported projects. This is uh, what used to be the Ohio Department of Development supported projects. And there are, this is all shown all kinds of different technologies. But uh, you can see those are more spread out, less linked to the wind resource and more linked to um, where the application, grant application came from. But you can see there's quite a few. And most of these are what we call distributed generation projects where it's like a school, uh, a hospital municipality, something like that where the power is being used locally at that site and not for sale on the, on the grid. So jobs. If you kind of look at it here, we're kind of in the center of this. And, and, and I'm not going to get too much into it, but there's a massive, there's over 8,000 components in one of these machines. And you think about all the engineering and all the, the stuff that makes one of these projects happen, humongous jobs opportunities, both in the planning, engineering, and implementation of these projects, manufacturing. And we are at the center of that. This is actually a clickable map. I'm not going to do it right now. The one thing I will say is we used to be rated at number two only behind California potential jobs coming from the wind industry, making the components, not, not, build, not installing them, but, but making the stuff that makes them work, Make, building stuff like Ohio used to do. Um, we were, number, we were number two when we were behind California in that, and now we've slipped. And that's what this map shows. States like California, uh, the, the Midwest, the Michigans, uh, the Pennsylvanias, they're, they're taking better advantage of the, their potential and we're losing our place. That said, our market has still grown. Our, our industry, when all of our other manufacturing was dropping off, the renewable energy efficiency industries, all those were actually increasing jobs. And this is true even through the big calamity. So it's kind of interesting to think about that. This is actually another map showing where all these jobs are. And you can see we have just a few, over 60,000 jobs now. These statistics are highly manipulable, but it gives you a sense of magnitude of what industries you're talking about. It is a major, major industry possibility for Ohio. Already is with or without us in this room. It is going to go on. Um, and then, hey, I'm actually going to do this. Wow. Um, <laughs> You guys may not have gotten anything out of it, but I made it through the slides. Um, so yeah, th and then obviously the big, the big economic play in Ohio is um, right now. I mean, obviously the industries are kind of funny. The industries are on autopilot. They're not waiting for the state. And this is true across the country. They're not waiting for the Fed. They're not waiting for the state. They're making their own decisions independently, making the best guesses and gambles they can. So in Ohio, we're trying to figure out a way to leverage this. And there's this organization called Lee Co., which came out of the work that we did out on, on Lake Erie with the crib and wind monitoring. Our goal was we did not want a company to go out there and take advantage of the public resource. We wanted that information to be a public domain. So that was what our mission was. When, when it got picked up by the, the leaders in, in Lee Co. and others, it became more of a let's get this big process going. And so what they want to do is install these pilot projects out there with the idea that Cleveland and North Ohio will become the center of not only manufacturing these components, but the big toys that is required to build them and install them. So the big barges, the, the technology to do this. And, it, and we, we would be the leaders in the world in freshwater uh, installations, because right now there's lots of installations in uh, salt water, but freshwater is a little different because the density, when you think about ice, although less ice every year, so it may be solved for us, but um, <laughs> freshwater has got a lot of higher density than, than uh, salt water. And so, something moving at even a millimeter an hour, you think about an ice flow that's miles long pushing on a foundation of a turbine, it's actually some interesting. But to be honest, somebody said it before, I think it was you, said, engineer, I'll solve that problem in 10 minutes. I mean, seriously, those, the engineering problem is the easy part. It's the, it's the public will, political financing, those are the challenges where are really holding those projects up. Again, I think it's a matter, they've got a lot of money in the queue, they've, they've got a lot behind them. I think it's a matter of, of when, not if. So, holy smokes, right on time. How did that happen? So 8.45, I'm going to stay here. 
and talk, if anybody wants to talk after 9, but we did promise you could actually leave. We will unlock the doors, maybe. Um, but I, I realized that was a lot being thrown at you, covering a lot of different subjects. Um, we have pretty good expertise across the technologies. Um, I'm here to answer your questions. Um, happy to answer your questions. And hopefully I gave you a, a taste of what's happening. Again, I, there, this could be a years long course in covering, trying to cover all this stuff. So who's got questions? It's always going to be more expensive because the, I, let me rephrase that, the, the equipment's always going to be more expensive because the realities of the laws of physics, getting it out there, all that stuff. I think that initially those, that cost that power, you're going to be paying a premium for it like you're being asked to do right now in Ohio. Sign up, pay a premium for this power to get it going. You're going to see that price drop pretty quickly as economies of scale build in it. So think about building cars. Right now they're trying to build five cars. Well, imagine if they could build 10,000 cars the economy as the scale will drop. It's always going to be more expensive in the sense of that equipment, but you've got to remember there's twice as much energy out there, so eventually, long term, I actually think they're going to equalize. But that's probably 20 years out. Really, really good questions, and it's a big part of the play. Where we are right now, it's a trickle in the bucket. We can control it with dispatchable wind, basically predict the weather like we're talking about. We improve that literally every, every month. We're improving our ability to do that. So we, we know the wind is coming. We can predict it, kind of like we did before with other technologies, and then we can dispatch wind. So if we high prediction, we, we deploy the big coal plant first, ramp it up first, and then we fill it in with the natural gas fired, uh, some, some storage of uh, hydro, so dispatchable, called dispatchable wind, dispatchable hydro. Um, there's a lot of conversation in how do we store wind power. A lot, the other big player in this is smart grid. Can you get it to, it's produced here, it's needed over there, how do I get it there? How, when, when I need it, how do I get it back at a countrywide scale? Now efficiency plays a big part in that. Some material science comes into that play, superconductors and all that stuff. Because right now, a lot of people don't realize by the time electricity makes it to your house, you've lost a ton of the power in that. So that's, what, again, where distributed generation comes into play. If you can get that turbine right at the site, like we try to do at our sites, the economics for that site and the environmental benefit and social benefit is higher. Um, all right. Denmark, storage. All right, Denmark. Denmark is obviously a lot of things going on in Denmark. They are, what we're seeing in Europe is they're starting to struggle with this balancing act of you can't just look at the wind power. You have to look at the whole picture, so the infrastructure. I'm actually not sure what, what Denmark is doing as far as, I know they do have hydro, I know they do have, have storage, that they're doing that way. They're also doing a lot of control and there's curtailing going on all over the world right now. So there are days where wind farms are being forced to shut down because they can't get the power out. It's probably the biggest problem is in the US right now. It's actually really impacting the economics. Um, that's where you hear these big demands for, for bigger grids. Um, so yeah, I think the other thing that's happening is smart grids, um, time of day usage. The, the, the other part that's coming into this is, is there, and it's actually rolling out even in Ohio here, where they're going to want to be able to control when you turn on, and this is be very short durations, but your AC unit, uh, when you do your laundry, those kinds of things. You're starting to see appliances, the controls where you, the dishwasher will flip on at 2 a.m. Imagine that at an international scale, that is actually a really good way to do, quote, storage. Is that more or less answer? Sure. I know it's, it's a much bigger topic than I can. From a physics standpoint, it works. From an economic standpoint, it falls apart. And, and the reason is every time you change a mode of energy, you lose efficiency. And how do you predominantly get hydrogen is through a very electricity intensive process called electrolysis. Right, and right, but it's, I mean, if you look at it from an efficiency standpoint, it, it is a possibility. But actually, I'm more, from hydrogen production, I'm, it, it kind of, there's some interesting biomass ways of getting it, like sugar beets and things like that to get hydrogen. There's some new algae pro programs to get hydrogen. I think it's part of it. But I don't think it's right now, we're just not there. And the handling of that amount of hydrogen you're talking about is, is an insane proposition. You look at the amount of power we use. So there's micro implications for it. 
There's possibilities for research and development in it. Um, it's not the best path right now. Yes? Well, it's, it's actually a complicated answer. The reality is, 100 years ago, it was financially viable, just like it is today, it's financially viable. It just depends on the project. So a couple factors. Who's running the project? Who's installing the project? So I install one of these things in my house. I'm maintaining it myself. Some people in this room might hire it out. Well, small scale wind turbine, bring a guy out for $2,000 to maintain your turbine, you've used your entire production. So that's a big factor. Um, the other thing is, what's your wind resource? If you're up on Lake Erie and you're right on the shore, that's an economic viable project today. If I'm down in southeastern Ohio, probably not going to happen for you. The other thing is scale. A lot of folks are tempted to put in really small machines. The, the larger the machine, and this is true, you see it happening in the, in the commercial scale too, larger machine, more economically viable. So uh, you know, 10 kW machine for residential, price per watt installed, actual benefit out, economic return, cost benefit analysis, all that stuff improves. Um, so yeah, and it, it, it's a challenging market right now. So it's a buyer beware, work with somebody that really knows what they're doing uh, market. And it can work today, but it, you've got to do it right. I think if, if you play the two together, which is interesting, because solar and wind, typically when you have sun, you have less wind. When you have wind, you have less sun. Those two naturally marry together. And then we think about other, other dispatchable technologies and renewables. You start throwing those into the mix, things get better. I think when you start getting around 40%, um, things get chaotic. And right now in the US grid, it would be a much lower number than that um, under the current, especially because where the wind's coming from. Right now, as of today, we have a problem in some locations. The panhandle of Texas, we cannot get some of that power out of there. In, in Iowa, even as close as it is to Chicago, we cannot get, in some days, we cannot get that power out of there. So that, throw it all together, think about it moving together, the number's probably somewhere, re and of course you'll hear the politics and the company lines will be, it, we already can't do it, it's impossible, can't be done. Well, the reality of our projects, and we actually monitor the power, is our projects put out better quality power than the utility grid does. And we're actually forced, and this is a key note for folks, just for defense of our projects, most of the times you see our projects not running, it's not because the project's broken, it's the grid that's broken. We have to, by law, shut down the turbines if the power quality on the grid becomes subpar. Figure that irony out. They're actually liable to that same ruling. Um, they just doesn't get enforced the same way. So we actually have to shut our machines. Most of the time our machines are going down, it's because there's a grid fluctuation. Um, yes? This kind of goes back to a little bit what he was saying. Selection is based on motivated person on site. The, we, we find, especially at the distributed generation projects, the ones that go forward, and it has nothing to do with the, whether the project's functional or not. I, there's a local company here I promised a, a three-year payback with a million-dollar positive cash flow in the first year. They turned it down because they wanted a three-month payback. That is the conversation where that's a short sightedness we're in. But if you get a site, and, and positive cash flow is out of the gate, promised, by the way, in that. Very little investment. It still was not acceptable to them. Why can they not compete in the, the global economy? I, I don't know. Um, but this is local. I, I'm not going to say who it is. I don't want to bash them. But the, the, the projects that go forward are that motivated person that is, is willing to get engaged right now. What we're trying to do is buy that down. Because right now, it requires quite a bit of energy on their part to get engaged. The superintendent's job is to teach students, facilitate students. It's not to become a power company for themselves. Now, there are ways to leverage that and facilitate that, but what we're, our, the Kilowatts for Education came about was how do we create replicatable models where we buy down that, that point of entry, increase the level of certainty that the project is going to work. And so the reality is what we did is we kind of word of mouth reference between our network selected, they self-selected in some ways, um, them into the, the beta pool. We raised a lot of money for them, so they were pretty much covered that way. And then we um, implemented the projects, and then, the, then there's usually a, a team, a curriculum team, and other ways, and we're trying to integrate it. So again, Sue Teacher over here does not repeat what Johnny Teacher over here did. They share lessons learned, efficiencies increase. 
um, because teachers have too many other things to do than to try to learn something that they've never learned before. So how do we do pre-curriculum packets? And it goes on and on. There's a lot in that resource. So folks that are interested in it, the Kilowatts for Education program is really incredible what it's accomplished already. All the projects out of the federal projects funded or, or applied for were the only ones that actually got all our projects through um, with the exception of one which did not get the grant irony, our most uh, viable project. But all of them are viable, all of them are installed, and all of them are economically producing today. And that's the only one I'm aware of in the wind industry and the entire uh, stimulus package that was funded. Uh, with one more exception, uh, Lincoln Electric. Karen, it's also worth noting that you don't have to have a turbine or a Yeah, you don't. Yeah, it's good. Excellent point. You do not have to have a turbine, so Lakeland could join and, and access that data as a partner. There are different levels. Anybody, you as, in the audience can go on there and, and see stuff, but if you want the, the behind the scenes, really hardcore yeah. stuff, and, and our direct interaction, you have to become a member. There is no cost to becoming a member either, and there's no obligation to being a member, so join today. <laughs> right now, is, is, it, 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 the programs, the irony is the school projects themselves are, are self-funding and self-supporting, but the program as a whole is being funded by us, and someday we haven't tried to grant fund ourselves yet, but someday I'm going to need to actually, we need, we need to actually be able to pay our bills. So, buy stuff from us. Yes? Um, well, the first problem is you. Um, actually, you, no, you, 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 I'm sorry to pick on everybody, it's you. That's the hardest one to control. So your, your usage habits, do you f do the stupid thing like flip the switch off? Do you program your programmable thermostat to meet your job? Do you, do, you, do you use the technology you already have? Do you get the tube of caulk out? Realizing the tube of caulk costs you $2, but that tube of caulk will probably save you over $100 in a single year. Do you do those things? Do you change the light bulbs? I go into industry all the time. My first, and Crystal gets on me this, because I, I, I basically, I guess I want to be poor, because I go in there and I say, do not hire me to do this test again. This has been proven 50,000 times that lighting works, retrofits pay off, just do it. <laughs> do not pay me to tell you to do it, do not pay me to prove you to do it, it's been done before, just do it. And this is true of your home, and it is true of every single industry, every single school. Think of a public institution, a school, is it going to shut its doors tomorrow? Can it tolerate that six month payback on that lighting retrofit? If they do it themselves in three years, maybe if they use one of the, the programs out there by companies, and I'm not knock programs, but I don't like those programs. They are a way of implementing things, but they, they rob the benefit of, from the site. I, well, we could argue that. But <laughs> we'll have a friendly argument about it. But the other thing, we, we, controls would be a big thing, in, especially in commercial buildings. Controls, predictive uh, sh load shedding, uh, control load shedding demand charges, uh, predictive, like you know when people are going to leave, predictably ramping systems down. There's humongous lists of these, these no-brainer things that you can do. Um, everything from the simple insulation stuff to the lighting to the, the controls to the way you use a building to the way you um, time the using of your building. A building like this right now I see like this building for instance is used all over. Can you consolidate the way you use the building into smaller and more confined spaces and ramp down the other spaces? That's a simple scheduling thing, not that hard, especially a building like this that's built basically to move technology around. I could go on and on, but that's the kind of thing we need to talk about. Yes. Just as a follow-up, again, what Aaron showed in one of his first slides is the fundamental belief of what we're doing here is, to me, the best form of alternative energy is not to use it in the first place. So for, our, for Lakeland's energy footprint, as compared to 2008, we're 50% less. And again, there you, go. you know, and again, we, I mean, we lead North America in higher ed in and, energy conservation. And that's, that's, we call it a megawatt. That's right. We call, it, we call it a megawatt. And, and this is, I, I wasn't aware it was that good. And that's excellent. It shows that it can be done. And guess what? His job is not to keep the lights on in this building. That's not his goal. These are facilitating structures. <laughs> the, 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 right, the, these are facilitating structures. That's not your primary objective. Your primary objective is to teach students. So guess what happens to all that money and frees up? Now it can be focused yeah, towards the goal. And that's true of a home, too. Your primary goal in your home is not to, to pay the utility company. Your goal is to enjoy your home. Well, imagine you free up revenue, savings, revenue, same thing. 
board, board did it so that and money goes in there and it's yeah. it's an awesome thing and it's a proven it's a proven thing it does not require now when you get up in the higher level you're trying to reach those 70 percent and higher it starts getting interesting and some that you're really talking super advanced controls high degrees of commissioning the cost can go up but for the average person or company there is so much low-hanging fruit before you ever get to that so again I, I kick myself when I go and do an energy audit. We have, we, have, we, have dual, we have thermal cameras, we have all the toys. We go and do energy audits. Again, I don't tell people, I don't give them big fancy reports that are this thick because they're not going to use them. I give them a very short list and say, do these things and then we'll talk about, and I hate to say it, the wind turbine in the back and the photovoltaic array and all the other stuff that goes with it. Very, very practical approach. And that's, for a national economy, we need to start thinking about that. Pulling the rhetoric out of it and just focusing on the facts and the true economics.